So today we are starting 26 years on the air. Wow. That's very impressive. Thanks to uh, John Karahoff that you don't see on camera. He's behind this glass wall in the control room and his partner over the whole journey, Mr. Michael Peterson, who is uh, our floor director today. Uh, and uh, we, uh, in this program, we celebrate the achievements of our public school system. And we uh, introduce uh, the, the real uh, players in the arena. And one of our very, very important personalities is Kingsley Butchway. Kingsley Butchway, Mr. K Mr. Butchway soon would be Dr. Butchway soon. And uh, he is the rising star in many aspects in our community, whether it is educational, social, or political. And uh, it's my pleasure to have on my left-hand side Emma Wallace, who is starting today uh, with us our, as a co-host of this program. And we have high hopes that she's going to be uh, staying with us for the rest of the year, right? Oh, yeah. I'm not going anywhere. <laughs> You're not going anywhere. <laughs> I will not let you anyway. Uh, Mr. Butchway, uh, I want you to start giving a little, uh, uh, a little bio about yourself. And then tell us what you, you are the director of equity and management in the Iowa City Community School District, plus other things, mm. like you are the pro-tem mayor of Iowa City as well. And uh, so I would like you to tell our viewers who are new to this community, who is Kingsley Bachway? Yeah, definitely. So um, my name is Kingsley Botchway. I'm the Director of Equity Engagement for the Iowa City Community School District. Um, I play a lot of different roles um, uh, when it comes to that, but um, obviously um, from a community standpoint as well, I play the role of Mayor Pro Tem for Iowa City. So um, I, I know this community well, and you know I want to see it prosper and grow, not only obviously from a city council standpoint, but from an educational standpoint as well. And, from the, uh, and you are a lawyer by training, right? Yeah, so I uh, <laughs> yeah, went to law school. Um, it's been about 10 years now. Graduated three, uh, seven years ago. Um, and so, you know, use that training um, a lot in some of the day-to-day -day correspondence, but also to really uh, get to some of the social justice issues, um, some of the uh, social change I'd like to see in this community. Uh, how, how long have you been uh, serving now in the school district? I've been in the school district almost now three years, three and years. I've been on city council um, and complete, completed my fourth year. Ah, so uh, this term is about done, right? Yes. Are you running now? Yes, I am running for re-election. Okay. We wish you all the best. Thank you. Luck and success. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so, Emma, we pay you a lot of money to be here, right? <laughs> 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 so you go ahead. Uh, now I want you to uh, start the first question to uh, All right, our yeah. distinguished, distinguished <laughs> guests. Press these issues. Yeah. Um, so uh, the first one I would like to talk to you about it is uh, the is AVID or AVID. It's, it's an acronym and yeah. uh, it's also a program that is taking off here in Iowa City in the community district. So if you could explain that a little further, what is the program and what is its purpose? Yeah, so uh, AVID is an acronym for um, Advancement via Individual Determination. It's a program that we're currently piloting at Kirkwood, uh, Weber, and Northwest. Uh, Kirkwood we started last year, and Northwest and Weber we're bringing on this year. It's a really exciting program. Um, it's about uh, engagement, um, collaborative learning, um, critical thinking, uh, critical questioning, level questioning. Uh, really is focused on that growth mindset and ensuring that we're using that growth mindset in whatever we do. Uh, I'm excited about the program, especially um, we had our project manager here um, the last two days. Um, actually, not today, but um, Tuesday and Wednesday. Uh, and it was just really awesome to, you know, 
have them come in and see the wonderful work that we're doing. Within the first year, I'm, I'm kind of a, a driver, right? To you know, be the best really quickly. Within the first year, um, we will be moving towards um, being an avid showcase for the entire Central Division that goes from Minnesota down to Texas. And so uh, we're excited about that achievement. We're excited about the work that Kirkwood's doing because Kirkwood will be the avid showcase school. And so uh, we're really moving forward on these initiatives and, and pushing it um, so we can achieve, basically it's achieving that data, achieving that growth that we want to see and we know that our kids can, our kids can achieve. Awesome. Um, <clears throat> and so then that will move into my next question, yeah. which will be uh, what is Title IX and what are the changes, if there are any, that are going on in the Iowa City Community School District? Yeah, it's really interesting because there's a, a lot of different issues within equity and um, a lot of them have popped up. Um, in recent months, in the recent years, um, just because of the changes in the climate uh, across the nation and locally and, and within the state, um, Title IX um, change has occurred is uh, basically from um, the Secretary um, of Education, uh, Betsy DeVos, that basically rescinded the Obama administration guidance. That guidance really provided um, school districts with the ability to have a clearly defined process on how to go through complaints, um, when um, we were, um, how, the process by which we would receive notification, um, act on notification, and so it was a really important guidance to, to see where the Justice Department would fall on different issues so we could make sure that we are adjudicating um, different claims properly. Uh, the problem with it uh, initially was that, you know, with this rescindance, there isn't really been given any type of guidance as far as how we are going, supposed to move forward. However, it has provided that, you know, our school district can um, you basically act accordingly with whatever process we have now or whatever process we'd like to change to. Uh, because we feel like the Obama administration guidelines were a very strong process, they really focused on, um, again, the victim, but also provided due process uh, for everyone involved. Uh, we're going to continue with that guidance until we hear it otherwise. Um, it's important, I think, for um, a lot of our, not only victims of sexual harassment, sexual assault, to know that, but also to the community at large, to know that we take um, sexual harassment, sexual um, assault seriously, and that we're going to continue in this process because because uh, we believe it's a fair process and really um, uh, does what it do, do, helps us do what we can as far as uh, making sure that we have a safe environment for all of our students. And historically, uh, Title IX has provided a lot of support for women in particular. Right? Yes, you know, it's it's the been education. instrumental uh, from that right. standpoint, and so. You know, any changes to Title IX or any discussion on Title IX, we don't take lightly, and we and we want to make sure we focus on. Uh, how about if you uh, discuss with it all the uh, efforts that you are doing right now to train the staff and the teachers? Yeah. So, uh, especially uh, the program that you just developed, that the implicit bias training. No, it's, uh, it's definitely a really good program, and I would say that we're one of the few in the state and also probably in the nation to really address implicit bias at its core. Uh, it's also interesting because I you know, had a coaching session today with some teachers, and it's a reflective process. It's, uh, we're working on you know, how does implicit bias play out in our school system, reflect on our own implicit biases, and how do we mitigate and eliminate those biases so we can make sure that we're doing the best for all of our students. Sorry to interrupt you, but implicit is the opposite of explicit. Correct. Right? So implicit is kind of covert. Okay? Yeah. It's, it's not really in the open, right? Yeah, covert, unconscious right. bias that occurs um, that, you know, you it's malleable. You know, we know from research it's malleable and that if you spend the time training, um, making sure that you are learning about awareness uh, or increasing your awareness, learning about other strategies to help mitigate the bias and eliminate the bias, then you see the transition that it happens not only in the school building but also other implications um, that um, implicit biases, you know, police department, um, health um, hospitals. And so it's definitely a practice that and training that is used in uh, multiple um, situations. So the, the implicit bias usually results from the, um, I, I wouldn't say ignorance, but uh, uh, low information standard, right? I mean, people who were not well informed. Well, you can't. Yeah, right? and, and when they learn, they may change, right? Yeah, you can't teach what you don't know. And right. I think that, you know, living in Iowa um, obviously affords us some wonderful opportunities, but it also, um, there's a lack of diversity here. And um, while we are becoming more diverse very rapidly, we need to make sure we're trained and prepared to 
work with and partner with diverse populations um, to ensure they're doing best for all students. And, and, and one of the, uh, this will, will be in the form of professional development, uh, regular sessions, or it will be workshops for teachers. How, how do you uh, vision the uh, uh, process itself, the procedure? Well, it's job embedded. You know, we want to make sure um, that it's a part of their everyday um, job or daily life in that sense. And so um, we go um, once a month uh, and provide professional development, usually on a Thursday, but at least for an hour to an hour and a half every month to ensure that we're coming back in a more consistent way than rather just having one or two workshops over the course of the year. Right. And it's um, it's been really good because we can we can have that consistent, not only feedback, but also training and instruction to ensure our, sure our teachers are um, moving forward. We evaluate in the front end to kind of know where our teachers are at. The and, assessment, yeah. Yep, and we evaluate on the back end to see uh, whether or not there's any growth and whether or not we need to change for next year to ensure that we're really embedding um, and talking about the practice uh, and making it actionable as well. So I imagine that teachers would try to uh, provide you with kind of reporting about their progress, mm -hmm. what they see as positive, what they see as something hindering their ability to execute uh, the policy and so forth, right? Right, it's, and it's really focused on you know courageous conversations and making sure that we're honest and reflective about our own practice and our own biases, whether personal or professional, and how those interact with the system, especially the school system, when we're dealing with kids. And so, you know, um, that assessment piece is so important because ultimately we want to make sure that that growth is occurring, and if it's not, we'll make changes and, um, and, and do a better process. You just mentioned something about the increasing diversity of our uh, school system and our population mm -hmm. uh, and the demographic changes as well. And, and, uh, and, and, and one of the really uh, so pleasant uh, uh, steps that uh, I would say concrete step uh, to further the cause of supporting uh, kids who are considered marginal uh, is uh, your initiative to uh, implement a new policy to uh, support and protect uh, our LGBTQI mm -hmm. uh, uh, population in schools? And uh, uh, I think we have some questions about that, right? Yeah. <coughs> Other than um, first question is what is the LGBT right. task force? I know that you're on it, right? And and you're on that as well as a citizen who isn't aware of that, but is part of the LGBT community. What's what is what is the task force essentially? Oh, definitely. You know, basically, uh, we we've on our. I believe our third iteration of a student climate survey that we give out. At first it started with our 6th, 8th, and 11th um, graders. Then it morphed to 5th uh, fifth and 6th, 5th through 12th graders last right. year. And then from that uh, analysis, uh, we decided to ask about um, uh, an individual students in LGBT um, status. And so from that, we were able to really detect some serious disparities that we were seeing um, with our LGBT population in comparison with um, other populations. Because of that, we felt it was necessary to put a task force together to really um, bring community input um, to talk about not only strategies that we're currently doing um, and what we need to do better, um, but also um, new strategies that, you know, the different community members and different people within the organization, or people within the task force, excuse me, uh, can bring to bear and, and push us in a new and innovative way. And so that's really been exciting um, because this is work that is not being done. I, I know it's not being done in Iowa. Um, and I've gotten the support of um, the Iowa Safe Schools who's really interested in all the different changes that we're making, whether that's gender inclusive restrooms, um, ensuring that there's GSAs at all the different secondary schools. Um, you know, this is something that's been important to me and was important to me when I um, took the position as equity director uh, because I wanted to make sure that we 
um, as Iowa City and the Iowa City Community School District are moving forward in progressive ways to ensure that uh, we're not overlooking all, any of our students. And so the task force speaks to that. The plan is to go through this process with the task force, get that critical feedback, have them um, come together and really provide us with recommendations that we will then and they will also um, present to the board. And then the hard work comes. You know, then that's where you know, we really need to implement those recommendations and move the conversation forward. And, and you, uh, you worked with the Public Policy Center of the University of Iowa under the leadership of uh, Sarah Brock and yeah. her team of researchers. And, and they prepared uh, this wonderful report of 16, 17, and then 17, 18 that they are working on now. Uh, the, the first one was more focused on the uh, minority kids in our mm -hmm. classrooms. Uh, without maybe you, they touched upon the LG, uh, BT uh, population, but it was not as serious as this study now. Correct. This was focused really on this. So, in other words, what I would like to ask you: Did you come up with this idea after you saw the fruitful results of the first survey? Mm -hmm and you found that it is positive, so let us extend, expand it. Is that, is that how, how it happened? Or? Yeah, to a certain extent. I mean, you know, I would say that we, we saw some of the issues that came with the first survey, and we saw some of the discrepancies, and so we wanted to make sure um, that we were um, digging a little deeper from that perspective. Uh, I would say that I, I am aware of anecdotal um, information that I receive on a semi-regular basis about the, the hardship that our LGBT students are feeling in schools. And so because of that, it was in our mind as far as you know, wanting to know, wanting to ask that question. Um, but we did not know that the data would come back the way it came and didn't know that it would be so disproportionate, so discrepant, um, that again, we, were, we, we needed to, it was almost, uh, you know, a, demand almost because of the data that we were seeing that we needed to move forward in this particular way. And in designing the task force that took this research and studied it uh, and discussed it and uh, they are going to provide you mm -hmm. as a district with certain recommendations and uh, maybe advice. Uh, can you tell me how this task force was formed? I mean with from where they come. Yeah, basically we sent the communication out to the entire community and um, the University Public Policy Project, I didn't say that before, has been instrumental um, throughout this process, not only with the report, but obviously putting together the task force um, for the LGBT, but also the student climate, the original student climate task force that um, helped coalesce some of the recommendations of the original report. Uh, basically, we had a, a number set to it'd be around 30 participants. We broke it down from district, um, the community partners and then um, parents and students. Uh, we always want to make sure that the district is um, the lowest percentage in that particular group and so we don't necessarily have uh, I would say like 10, per 10 people from that group but that's okay because we wanted to overbalance that group just because of some of the concerns we hear from the community that we don't have you know open groups where the community feels you know comfortable coming and talking about issues that have, are of real importance. So we want to make sure we overweighted it that way. We also wanted to make sure that we had um, a majority minority group in the same sense that we did for our first task force. For our first task force that was um, mainly balanced from a standpoint of um, there were more people of color on that task force um, than you know you would normally see especially in our Iowa City community. In the same way we did this particular task force and make sure it was majority minority group. So we had more individuals that ended identified as LGBT um, on that task force than um, didn't. And so that was very important. Uh, we, it, it was a long deliberative process. We worked through um, kind of a, a blind analysis where we each went through each of the participants' answers to determine who would have, be a best fit for the, um, for the task force. And then we you know, notified participants and um, sent them research um, briefs and things to get prepared for and, and went forward from there. It was really thrilling attending the meetings of the task force and see young students expressing their ideas taking a leadership, like uh, at the table where I was contributing, mm -hmm. uh, a, a young lady stood up, she was the leader of the group and talked about what we agreed upon and what recommendation we had. So that was very encouraging that uh, 
kids felt that their opinion is respected and appreciated yeah. among all those adults and, and older people like me. So, <laughs> I mean young people. <laughs> <laughs> okay, you go next. Uh, probably the hottest topic, so that's why we saved it for last, um, <laughs> is immigration. Obviously, that's been a huge thing recently with, with ICE. Yeah. And uh, how is the Iowa City School District taking steps to ensure that students are safe, you know, that they're, that they're not going to have to deal with ICE officers coming into their school, you know? And, cool. and, and you know, honestly, keeping that environment of, of safe school for all students, you know, regardless of race, you know? So how, what, what are you guys doing? <laughs> That's a great question. You know, I think that there's a lot of um, misinformation about school's role when it comes to immigration. Uh, first and foremost, there's, you know, uh, legal, legal ramifications um, that um, we can't ask for immigration status. That's on Plyer v. Doe. Uh, I urge anybody to, you know, take some time and, and read for, through that important court case because that really guides a lot of the work that we're doing now. So not only do we have that court case that talks about, you know, we don't ask for immigration status, we just, kids come in, and it's important for us to make sure that we acknowledge that. Um, but there's also um, our par parameters around that where from a, from a federal standpoint, um, any type of ICE request that would come, um, you know, we have FERPA guidelines, um, which basically um, put us in situations where we're not necessarily able to share that information um, uh, right away, uh, unless there's an ex exigent circumstance, which would be some type of emergency that would that information would be would be needed. But um, besides that, you know, we need a subpoena. Um, we need enough time to review that subpoena. It's a highly a highly engaged process um, with the school district, the attorneys, to really kind of look into this ICE request. There's also notification for parents once we receive a subpoena, so they're notified. And so it, it really is focused on. Um, again, protecting the students' interests. You know, we're a school district. Um, we're an educational institution, and so that is our clear focus. And regardless of what happens, um, you know, outside um, those walls, uh, we have to protect our students in any way, shape, or form. And so um, we're, we're pre preparing admin guidelines to that extent to make it clear, not only for staff, but also the community, um, where the school district stands. Um, there is consistent um, communication rhetoric um, from the federal government um, that is unclear um, and that doesn't um, seek to provide information to our immigrant families as far as where they stand. And so from a school district standpoint, we wanted to be clear with that message. So every time something happens or rhetoric, you know, is stated um, by, you know, a variety of elected officials at the federal level, or even the state level, um, we, we wanted to make sure that we had a clear message. And, you know, if anything changed that was in law, we would um, act accordingly. But uh, right now, um, we're, we're doing what we know from a law standpoint uh, and focusing on it from that standpoint to do what's best for our students. Well, uh, that was very informative. I, I just want to uh, <coughs> uh, tell you, uh, Dr. Bachway, that we, uh, I, I have just read uh, recently uh, the report of the uh, Human Rights Watch. Mm -hmm and uh, it was staggering. It, it was mainly dealing with the issue of LGBTQ uh, uh, population in our schools. It, 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 it is really surprising to read this, and I, I'm, I'm urging people who are watching us now to go to the internet and try to read this report. Mm -hmm. it's, it's a very detailed report, but in it, you would find some states that don't even allow teachers to talk about uh, gender uh, choices or gender orientation, sexual orientation. You are not allowed to do that by law. And these are about 12 states in right. the United States. So we are lucky here that we have this kind of uh, broad-mindedness and openness and tolerance and loving for everybody uh, in our community. And we, ha we are blessed to have that. Mm -hmm. So uh, at the conclusion of this uh, episode, I cannot tell you how much I appreciate you coming today. I know that you're, you're, uh, you are wearing many hats, more than I do. But, uh, 
But I mean, thank you for coming and for explaining to our audience. Is there anything you want to add? We have like one minute if you would like to take it. Yeah, I just uh, I just appreciate this community. Um, you know, again, not necessarily being from this community originally. Um, you know, it's welcomed me and has really supported the initiatives that are important, not only from a school district standpoint, not only from a student standpoint and a family standpoint as well. And so I have to give my hats off to this community because there are a lot of things that put us above and beyond. and. I want to push that envelope. You know, I want to make sure that um, the growth that I have received by learning from this community is the same growth that I can um, hope to achieve in the school district. And I work tirelessly every day to make sure that happens. And so um, I'm excited and just a huge shout out, not only to the community, but to you all um, and you, Dr. Arcadi, because you know, without you and the work that you've done, not only in the school district, but just in the community with this effort and other efforts, um, it's really put it, it's really put equity initiatives to the forefront um, of a lot of um, the different things that are going on in the community and it's necessary and so I thank you for that. I, it's just uh, paying back for uh, a community that gave us all this wonderful life. Yeah. Uh, Dr. Bachwe, thank you very much. Emma, we cannot thank you enough. But uh, this program will be on channel 18 or the 800 channels if you are uh, well to do and you have the box of uh, Cable. media come media, media come box, yes <laughs> yeah. and uh, and and we are if you if you we are already on YouTube tonight will be on YouTube as a matter of fact okay. so there is no excuse hear that and uh, I think uh, Dr. Bachway had already answered a lot of your uh, inquiries and uh, questions and wondering he did address everything. And uh, thank you very much for uh, our people who are hiding behind the glass door. Uh, Mr. John Karhoff and uh, our floor director, Mr. Michael Peterson. Thank you.